Welcome to the Heavy Spoilers Show, I'm your host Paul, in this video we're breaking down Dune. The movie's filled with a ton of details that I think we need to talk about, as well as a deeper meaning to what's going on. Now as of making this, Dune Part 2 isn't out yet, and thus I'm keeping things locked solely to this film. Therefore, we're not going to spoil any of the big reveals for that, and instead I'll keep that separate for its own big breakdown. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss that, and if you enjoy this one then please hit the thumbs up. We do big breakdowns like this every week, and will definitely become at least your fifth favourite channel on YouTube, but please just give me 70 seconds of your time whilst we shout out our sponsors and then get into the breakdown. Gather round, seekers of quick triumph and expedited victories. Behold a realm where simplicity is the harbinger of triumph. I'm sounding like the games master, and that's because we're here to talk about Monopoly Go. It's a brand new way to play, and board flipping cleanup is no longer required. Experience classic fun and visuals with gameplay fit for your phone. Collect properties, build houses and hotels, pull chance cards, and of course, earn Monopoly money. Play with your favourite game tokens such as the race car, top hat, battleship and more. Earn tokens as you go, and watch Monopoly come to life with brand new characters too. I love mobile games because they allow me to escape when I've got a free moment. With Monopoly Go, you can experience the reimagined world of Monopoly, guided by everyone's favourite zillionaire, Mr. Monopoly. They've got new boards themed after world famous cities, fantastical lands, and imaginative locales. Monopoly Go has got the classic fun with modern gameplay, and it allows you to experience the classic Monopoly with visuals tailored for your phone. I'm dying to get back to it, and if you guys want to play as well, then just scan the QR code on screen right now. You can also click my link in the description, and it'll take you straight to the app, or scan the QR code to download the game now. Monopoly Go lets you become a tycoon for the day. Forget the risks and investments though, just have fun, and yeah, dive into the game. Thanks. Now in order to start this journey, we need to go back, way back into time. That takes us to the year 1965, which is when Frank Herbert released the book, to her massive success. Great success. Immediately, everyone saw the film potential, with Arthur P. Jacobs locking down the rights. That gave the producers nine years to make a movie, but sadly passed away during 1973. 74 hit, and with nothing being made, they were then acquired by Jean Paul Gibbon. Bringing in Alejandro Jodorowsky to direct, they then started on creating the movie. For Jodorowsky, he looked at the names at the time and tried to get as many prominent figures included as he could. Salvador Dali was going to play the Emperor with Orson Welles playing Baron Harkonnen. Paul Atreides would be played by some Brontis, Mick Jagger was going to play Fade. Sting ended up in the role for the David Lynch one, and it's kind of funny how two musicians ended up playing the part. Jodorowsky also looked at musicians at the time to help create the soundscape, and Hans Zimmer actually gave an odd to this. During the production, he sampled Pink Floyd for Eclipse, which was then used in the first trailer for the film. One day, the legend will be born. All of civilization depends on it. However, as with most projects trying to adapt the book, they found out early on it was nigh on impossible. Thought to be a 14 hour epic, that was just too much for this to actually get made. You see, the thing with Dune is that if you've read the book or listened to the audiobook, you'll know that the movies, they, they miss a lot out. The source material has lots of different threads and directions that you could potentially take a film, and a writer has to weave those threads together to create one straightforward plotline. I'd say it's like if you took the Song of Ice and Fire books that, that were made for Game of Thrones, but tried to adapt them into a two hour film. Sure, you're going to have your main character potentially in someone like Jon Snow, but you're going to miss out a lot of what's going on. Therefore, it's a challenge to adapt, and that's why pretty much every adaptation focuses on Paul. Now, according to the wiki, the work didn't go to waste, and elements of it ended up in Alien. None other than H.R. Geiger was behind the designs of both, and in his concept of for Dune, you can see shades of Ridley Scott's masterpiece. Looking at the landscapes and the xenomorph itself, it's easily identifiable in the suits used in the film. The skulls and elongated heads are there as well, with sandworms also being echoed in the film. Now 1976 is when a big change came about and Dino De Laurentiis purchased the rights. That year is extremely important as we of course had Star Wars in 1977. It's often thought that if any of these adaptations had beaten Lucas to the punch that the landscape of cinema would look a lot different. Both are space opera epics but it's in the tone where the pair differ. Whereas Lucas took inspiration from Dune, it ended up being a fun and upbeat movie. Hello there. Dune, on the other hand, was always intended to be, well, well Dune, and it was in 1978 that they got a screenplay together. 
The novel's author Frank Herbert was commissioned to write the script, and in the end he turned in a three hour long treatment. Ridley Scott was hired in 79, with H.R. Geiger coming across as well. Here they wanted to split the book into two parts, which is of course something Villeneuve also ended up doing. Struggling to adapt it though, the production moved too slow, and Scott ended up going over to direct Blade Runner instead. The rights were then renegotiated with Laurentiis buying them up again, and hiring an up and coming David Lynch. Lynch was hot off the back of the Elephant Man, and at the time also got offered Return of the Jedi. However, he ended up going to Dune after reading the book and falling in love with it. Lynch originally wanted two films as well, but this was condensed into just being one movie. Running at over four hours, he was forced to cut it down, and we ended with what I I'd describe as a hatchet job. A longer version was released for TV, and we've of course also had the film dropped on physical media. If you want to see it, then make sure you pick up the Arrow 4K, and in case you don't know, bit of spam, but we've actually partnered up with them. If you go to the site and use the code Heavy Spoilers, guess what? You get 10% off. Just go to my link in the description and use the code Heavy Spoilers, and hey presto, you'll get 10% off tune. Either way, Lynch has said it's a bit of a sore point, and that he's got zero interest in what Villeneuve's doing. Seriously man, you and me, we're fucking done professionally. And that's not because he's a hater mate, calm down, but he said all it's gonna do is bring back painful memories. He said it wasn't the film he wanted to make, and overall it makes him feel like a failure. Lynch was never given final cut, and he was forced to condense major parts of the script. Voiceover was brought in to try and explain the plot holes, and it's clear that Lynch didn't have much of a say. During the release, he was also in the middle of working on a second script, as there had been plans there were going to be two sequels. However, once the movie bombed, it was kicked to the curb and moved out of the way faster than the Atreides. We then got the sci-fi miniseries in 2000, which actually, actually isn't too bad if you want to learn the lore. Unfortunately, it didn't have a big blockbuster budget, but that and all its sequels should get you filled in on the story. Then we had the Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter films, both of which managed to adapt expansive works. This made Paramount think they could finally make Dune, and in 2008 they brought on Peter Berg. This fell apart, and in 2011, Legendary bought it, which led to what we got today. Villeneuve was hired in 2016, and he's gone on record saying how much of a fan he is. Denny said he loved Lynch's film and followed all the making of stuff when he was a kid. Apparently he used to obsess over hearing about it in the Fantastic Film magazines, and read through the novel when he was 12. According to IMDb Trivia, he actually held off jumping on the film, as he wanted to direct some sci-fi movies first to get experience in the genre. Known for Prisoners, Enemy and Sicario, he held off until after doing Arrival in Blade Runner 2049. That takes us into the film itself, which like a lot of the other adaptations, split the book into two. However, Legendary New Dune was a risk, and thus they didn't want to film things back to back. A sequel was optioned, but it depended on the performance, which we'll talk about after we wrap up the breakdown. However, it meant some things had to be excised, including characters like Fade, who aren't present in the film. This was because they didn't want to waste time on things that would distract from the story here, and we begin with this message before we get the logos. This is some Sadakar throat singing, with it later being repeated when we go to their planet. There's lots of potential ways to take this quote, with Paul's dreams being laced throughout the movie. All of these help to hint at what's gonna come, and in many ways they hold symbolic meanings. In some he sees Chani, and in other he sees Jamis, who can be seen winning their battle at the end. But why is Paul dreaming of his death, especially when this is something that doesn't end up happening? Why don't you explain this to me like I'm five? Well, the way I take it is that this is Paul witnessing his death, or rather the symbolic death of the man he used to be. In every person Paul kills, a part of himself dies, which at the heart of it is what June's about. Jamis and some can also be seen as a teacher, which may symbolise his death showing a way that he can become a Fremen leader. This is the line that stands out to me the most, and Paul Atreides must die in order for the Kwisatz Haderach to rise. Also, I'm probably going to mispronounce things in this video because they change the pronunciation depending on what you read or watch. And yeah, I'm going to try my best, but just bear in mind if you're writing a comment about how I've mispronounced it, it's pr it's probably or it's already too late for me to change it. It was a quiz that's had a rack, give a dog a bone. Now there's even been theories that this voice at the start is Lido II looking back on the history of his family. Spice allows one to see into both the past and future, with one being able to tap into their family's genetic memory. There are theories that our own DNA can affect our personality, with us being guided by the ancestry that helped to shape us. 
The deep could refer to the history deep within us that spice in itself allows us to tap into. Strong theory. Either that, or it's just a great way to grab your attention with this popping up before the film's logos. The quote doesn't appear in the book, so hey, maybe, that, maybe that's why as well. It's just a theory. Memes are messages from the deep. Dreams, of course, also have a double meaning, as dreams can often mean someone's goals. This, in the end, will make him lose himself, and it's the cost that it takes to be the boss. When you take a life, you take your own. I think Villeneuve was smart to start it off this way, as Dune's pretty complex when you get into it. It tackles languages, religions, different houses, prophecies, technology, and also politics. So going with dreams, it just simplifies it down and gives us a thread that we can all easily relate to. One of the major criticisms about David Lynch's version is that the cut-down film was pretty incoherent. So in order to avoid this, the movie's about Paul's goals, in which he becomes a man fit enough to lead his house. Now one of the big differences in Dune compared to other science fiction novels at the time was that there wasn't the technological predictions that they had for humanity. Those were filled with laser guns, people typing in a vast computers, hanging out with robots, but all that stuff, it's completely absent from the work. Herbert hints towards what may have happened to push us from this, with him actually predicting where humanity would go next. He stated that once humans started relying on computers, that the men behind these computers would then enslave humanity. Now whether that's the case or not, it's something you can argue, but I'd say there's definitely an element of truth there. It's the ones who run our technology, social media and what we see, they're the ones who hold all the pieces. Predicting that back in the 60s, it's eerily chilling and it's what helped to shape the design of the universe. The text doesn't necessarily explain what happened in the war, but it does touch upon what's known as the Butlerian Jihad. This came when man overthrew machine and the idea that man should not be replaced pretty much became law. So you can't have androids or computers running things, and instead humanity turned to spice. This perception altering substance opened up our consciousness and allowed our minds to go to the next step. This is why we see people like the Mentats who are able to carry out computer-like calculations just within their head. Normally a Mentat starts taking spice as a child, and this allows them to gain position in a house. This will normally be somewhere where they can provide counsel, and thus in the end it's a coveted position. You see, every planet is ruled by a house, and all of these originate from Earth. The Atreides began their life in Greece, and as we learn, they were in fact matadors. The name Atreides plays on King Atreus, who was a prominent figure in ancient Greece. Fighting a bull was a labour of Hercules, and we also had the myth about the bull-headed minotaur. There's also bull models and icons laced throughout, and on the grave the Duke visits at 13 minutes, we can catch a bull and matador. This is the grave of Paul's granddad Paulus, who, as we learn, died during a bullfight. You can also catch Grecian letters on the bottom, tying back to their origins on Earth. In many ways, it's impacted how Duke approaches things, with him also saying, And grandfather fought bulls for sport. Yes. Look where that got him. A huge shout out to Now Playing Podcast for pointing out this shows that he shouldn't rush into combat against something that can wipe him out. In many ways, however, this leads to his downfall, as in the end, the Duke isn't brutal enough. In your eyes, I need to see it in your eyes. You never met Harkonnens before I have. They're not human, they're brutal! Now in the novel Dune House Atreides, we learn Paulus was betrayed by his wife Helena, who had a hand in drugging the bull. The Harkonnens themselves could even be seen as metaphors for them, with them blindly charging in and taking out the Duke. According to the wiki, the bullfighting sculpture we see was created in order to enforce this double meaning. Made by Luke Masassi, he wanted to use the bull to show the house Harkonnen. The word Harker also means bull, which is why it was picked as their enemy. The Matador itself would be House Atreides, and the cape would represent Arrakis. As for the houses, they're, they're difficult to infiltrate, as you either get into one in one of two ways. One can either be born through bloodline, or marry into it and become a family member. I'll talk about that more in a bit, but beyond that, spice also allows for interstellar travel. This is what's helped humanity journey through the stars, with a spacing girl leading us up. Now, the side effects of spice are that it makes your eyes blue, but it can also cause someone to mutate. It takes a vast amount in order for that to happen, but the spacing girl leaders are all something else. We don't fully learn exactly what that is until Dune Messiah, and in the book, Paul sneaks about the ship trying to see them before making it to Arrakis. Later on, we learn they're people that look like fish, which evokes the idea of them swimming through the stars. That's where we jump to after the logos, and we join Chani describing her people's conflict. The first person we see is Jamis, before we then pull up to see Chani beside him. These are two very important figures that will, in many ways, take Paul to the next path. 
and we learn spice is the most valuable substance in the universe, with Arrakis being the only place it's produced. Thus, the one who controls it controls the universe, which means the Harkonnens have amassed a fortune. Built on the bloodshed of the Fremen, it's said that they're richer than the Emperor himself. In this opening, we also meet the Beast, who's played by none other than Dave Bautista. In the David Lynch film, they all had red hair, Razia Villanov, he makes them all bald. A pale pasty look evokes the royalty of old, and in medieval times it tended to show privilege. This is why Elizabethans used to cake themselves in makeup, because the people who work jobs in the sun often got a tan from it. Villeneuve also wanted the Harkonnens to seem like this, because in the end it reflected where they were from. It's a colourless world with no natural light, completely bleak and just black and white. On the other side of this, Arrakis is bright and vibrant, with a first shot of spice almost seeming like glitter. Now, when writing the book, Lawrence of Arabia was an influence on Herbert's work, with a lot of the characters being similar to that. Hans Zimmer ended up looking at a lot of Middle Eastern music in order to craft a soundtrack that he felt would be accurate. Apparently, he spent a week in the deserts of Utah in order to listen to the sound of the wilderness and also the brushing sand. This helped him to compose the melodies and how he felt that the piece should sound. Now, Zimmer's, of course, worked a lot with Christopher Nolan, but in the end, he turned him down on Tenet. This is because he was such a big fan of Dune that he felt like it was going to be a dream project. Now, we discover that though the Harkonnens are winning, the Emperor forced them to pull back and here lies the plot. He realised they were richer and the Atreides were more popular, so kind of wanted them to both take each other out. From here, we could to Paul waking up on Caladan and get a flash of the air in the bottom right. It's important to know that this is not AD, and in the Dune universe, they measure with AG. This is after the Spacing Guild was formed and humanity moved into the stars. No one knows exactly how that translates to our time, as the appendices state a number of different things. The Universal Calendar is 20 hours shorter than Earth's is, and because they're not set on Earth, they also don't mention things like leap years. Thus, IMDb Trivia states that the movie takes place roughly at 23,000 AD. However, again, that, that might not be fully accurate, and I might be talking shit. And from here, we meet Paul's mother, Lady Jessica, who's not Duke Lido's wife, but instead is just a concubine. The universe is very much built on the patriarchy, but there is a female sect that also possess power. That is the Bene Gesserit, who have some political power and influence. The name is based on the Catholic Order Jesuit, with Frank Herbert's son Brian confirming that was the case. The Sisterhood can do things like the voice, which would later down the line influence Jedi mind tricks. Now when the pair are getting escorted to the desert, one of the soldiers that does this is deaf. This is Stephen Collins, who was picked on purpose by Villeneuve because this was something the voice wouldn't affect. Going back to those Greek metaphors, it's also clear that the Bene are influenced by many things. Books and Nachos pointed out they're a bit like the Sisters of Fade, who in themselves would influence the Norns. He's also influenced Star Wars as well, with them being the basis for the Sisters of Dathomir. Now one thing that I haven't mentioned yet is Spice allows you to pick the gender of your child, which is something they try to use to get power. For millennia, they've influenced bloodlines and advised the houses on who they should marry. This was so they could create the Kwisatz Haderach, who's someone that would be seen as the next messiah. The plan was to have Jessica bear a daughter, and this would then marry into the Harkonnens. Their child would then become the Kwisatz Haderach, unite the family, and finally those, finally those bloodlines, they, they'd all pay off. However, Jessica, she didn't care, threw a spanner in the work and had a boy, because she loved the Duke who was after her son. He's made you look a right knob. She has, to be fair, and, and what was the plan was basically the Kwisatz would sit on the throne, and along with this, they'd get all the abilities you get from Spice. They could travel through space, do all of the Mentat stuff, have the Bene Gesserit gifts, and also hit the thumbs up button. Now, it sounds pretty cool. We we've finally got someone who can lead us. However, what they'll really be doing is having someone in charge that the Bene can puppet around. Herbert also recognised the power of religion, which is something the Bene use as a weapon. They realised that if people believed en masse that this man was the Messiah, in the end, they'd follow him on a path they decided. Superstition and religion are used as a way to control, and thus this figure will let them control the universe. He'll be the most powerful being that ever existed, and will sit in the palm of their hands. However, the curveball by Jessica has really thrown them off, and this is why they need to test Paul. This test can see whether someone is an animal, which is how the Jesuit view most people. They think that animals won't be able to control themselves, and will act instinctively to get away from danger. Thus, only someone with upper consciousness can think of the situation and hold their hand in place to deal with the pain. Whether Paul is the messiah or whether he's just believing his own hype is also something that I think is deeply interesting. And of course, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that below, so whatever you think, drop it in the comments. 
Now it's also important to know that Paul asks for water, which in itself will become a valuable commodity. From this point we then see as the Emperor's messenger arrives and can catch Lady Jessica wearing a blue dress. The circles on it are actually the Bene Gesserit seal, which also appears on the dress of the one we see here. A sort of blue carpet rolls out of the ship too, with blue of course being the colour of water. The Mentat gives the cost of the journey. Three guild navigators, a total of 1.46 million 62 salaries round trip. Which is done for a number of reasons. You see, it not only shows how wealthy the Emperor is, but it also adds pressure that the Duke must accept. Though he knows it's gonna possibly lead to his end, he accepts because that's a thing to do. And from this point we meet Duncan Idaho, whose clothing of course resembles modern fighter pilots. His death is something that hangs over Paul with him envisioning it happen and then it coming true. In the dream we can catch a little beetle, which is something Duncan picks up before his death. Duncan says, Dreams make good stories, but everything important happens when we're awake, because that's when we make things happen. Which I think is a very layered quote. Now huge shout out to Turner SC on Reddit who broke down what this could mean. They state Paul's vision show possible outcomes and the closer he gets the more that he can change them. Dreams can help you get a glimpse into the future but it's only when you're awake that you're able to act. Paul seeing dreams of himself dying is the story of his death in which he will then waken as the Muad'Dib. Duke then explains what his goal is for Arrakis and how it will actually make them even more powerful. Here on Caladan we've ruled by air power and sea power. On Arrakis we need to cultivate desert power. Desert power. This plays off in the end with Paul finally realising he's able to attain that. Desert power. This will mean that they have complete control of all the necessary resources and truly be the most powerful house in the universe. Paul wrestles back and forth over whether he's the future though and the Duke ends up showing him his ring. Later when the Duke dies, Paul ends up wearing this, showing how he's now stepping closer to his destiny. Now from here we then meet Gurney Halleck with Paul mentioning how he recognises his stride. We have to tell you. <clears throat> Tell us you by your footsteps, Gurney Halleck. Someone might imitate my stride. This is something he touches upon later when Gurney rescues him in the desert. I recognize your footsteps, old man. At this point, we get a demonstration of the shield, which in the David Lynch films were these these big blocky Tron things. Here, though, they're completely transparent, except for when they get struck by a weapon. The way that they work is that if something strikes fast, then the shield is capable of blocking it completely. This is why guns are completely useless, because all it's gonna do is get blocked like you when you say this video's mid. Fuck off. Whenever we see the missiles of Hunter Seekers later on, you'll notice they slow down before hitting their target. With a blade, you can also strike slower, and this is why we see them going through the shield. This is signified by turning red, and as we know, red means dead. His fighting style was also developed by Roger Yuan, who based it on Filipino martial arts. This is refined and almost like a dance, whereas the Harkonnens are far more brutal. That was based on Mongolian fighting styles to culturally show the difference between the two. Now from here we cut to Gidi Prime and come across Baron Harkonnen. Morbidly obese, he's now at the point where he has to use anti-gravity tech to propel him in the air. Later they also allude heavily to Apocalypse Now with his head rising out of the pool similar to Captain Willard. However, he's definitely more in line with Colonel Kurtz who too often was seen completely basked in shadow. In the scene, we watch him running his hand over his head, which is something that Marlon Brando also did there too. In that film, the pool was sort of like a baptism, in which he arose as something new. With June, it's almost like him rising from black oil, born again after surviving the attack. Villeneuve said he saw the Baron as a human in rhino form, and rhinos of course also take mud baths. He realised that bringing the character to life was going to be what was either going to make or break the movie. Like medieval times, they also looked at figures there in order to go with how they designed the fat suit. Being overweight, that used to symbolise decadence and wealth, however, there is a reason for why this is the case. Might spoil the next movie, so we're just gonna skip her, but either way they end up covering him in mist, so you can imagine how large he is. At this point, the Bene Gesserit go to Earth, and we can see them moving through a tunnel out in space. It's thought that the Space and Guild are capable of folding out, which is something we witness in this moment. If you look closely, you'll notice a blue planet on the other end of the tunnel, which is where the Jezera have come from. Cutting across to Paul, we once more see him lying in bed, with his shot echoing the one from the beginning. Taking him out to the Gum Jabbar test, you can also see him already pulling at his collar. This could be because he's already experienced this in the previous dream, and he knows of the needle about to be at his neck. Yue then talks to him in Mandarin, which at this point is an old language from Earth. Helps to show how well read Paul is and how he's studied several different languages. You also see Lady Jessica start using sign language, which in the Dune world is called battle language. 
This was used so that communication could be kept silent and not intercepted by any spies or enemies. It's also easily recognisable, with each symbol being abrupt and identifiable, so there's no confusion if you're in the fog of war. In the room, we see the voice uttered by the Reverend Mother, which in itself carries a lot of symbolism to it. It shows that Benny are capable of controlling Paul, and that if they need to, he's gonna kneel before them. Kneeling, of course, means to be subjugated, letting us know instantly who it is that's in charge. We also see what those affected by the voice witness, with it pretty much becoming a blackout. Speaking of voices, Charlotte Rampling plays the Reverend Mother, and in real life, the actress is bilingual. She actually ended up dubbing herself in the French version, so if you swap the audio track, you'll also hear her there. Now, this is her trying to test Paul as much as possible, because to her, he shouldn't have been born. Jessica having him has altered their plans, but she still holds out hope that he could end up being the chosen one. This is why she later asks the Baron to spare him, because otherwise it's going to throw away millennia of work. We then get what's the most famous quote in the book, which is... Boiled down to its most basic terms, it means that if you give in to fear, it's going to end up destroying you. Fear can cause you to panic and react without thinking, which is something that Paul must resist. Though he wants to pull his hand out, he holds it in place and bears through the pain even though it's agonising. This is symbolically shown by palm trees burning and also him seeing his hand turn to ash. His sight is barely awakened and now he goes into the fire. These palm trees come to burn at the hour 24 mark, showing us how the prophecy was fulfilled. We also get a clip of his hand hovering above sand, symbolically representing how he must pass this to embrace Arrakis. It's important to bear in mind that when he goes to the planet, he doesn't actually touch it until the scene with the worm. Up until then, he'd been wearing shoes and stuff, but this physical touch provides a transformation. Cutting to their ship, we see it rising from the water too, which, just like a baptism, shows they're going onto something new. Paul touches the grass, similar to how he later touches the sand, which symbolises his farewell and his new beginnings. He also puts his hand into a pool of water, with sand sitting below. However, he doesn't touch this because he's not ready, and it's only in the rescue that he finally touches the sand. Lots of symbolism, and also most of these scenes were shot in Norway, which gives it a great contrast from when they go to Arrakis. That was shot out in Jordan Abu Dhabi, and the contrasting environments really make these moments pop. And from this point, we see as they land, and Gurney says his quote. My lungs taste the air of time, bone past fallen sand. This is a quote from the Orange Catholic Bible, which is one of the most popular religious texts in the entire universe. It fuses together the beliefs of Christianity and Islam, influences of which can be seen throughout the film. We also get that annoying bagpipe player that's brought into the score, and Zimmer said during lockdown his daughter used to kick off because sometimes he'd be recording at 5 in the morning. Just imagine that, getting woken up by that. You wouldn't be happy, uh, but I know some people love it, so if you do, let me know below. Now here for the first time, Paul witnesses the crowd that's gathered to see him, and quickly realise how much they've been brainwashed. It's kind of like when the Beatles touched down, and the Fremen were told there'd be an off-world prophet who would lead them to victory. The Bene Gesserit have just been manipulating them the whole time, and paving the way so Paul can take over. We then get to see the ornithopters, which are designed to resemble dragonflies. Bugs and insects were looked at closely by the production team, who all wanted to take their design and adapt them into this world. The Harkonnen helmets purposely appear bug-like, and there's also the insect design in the Hunter Seekers. In nature, dragonflies are brilliant navigators because their wings allow them to instantly switch flight modes. They can move quickly to lift and change to hover, with them also being able to maneuver quickly if one moves faster than the other. These sort of wings can do all of that, and thus it makes it an all-round craft. Going back to those Apocalypse Now motifs, their flights also echo the helicopters in that. Beyond that, Ornus means bird in Greek, again carrying on this idea of the Atreides lineage. We then see them travel out to the palace, which is of course based off pyramid designs. Looking up into space, we can also catch the many moons, especially that distinctive one in the Hand of God. Beside it is also the Muad'Dib, which is a moniker Paul later adopts. The Hand of God being next to the Muad'Dib could also symbolically show the plan that's there for Paul. In reality, this is simply just a canyon pattern, with them referencing the one on Mars in order to create the look. At the 55 minute mark, Duncan gives Paul a compass, because the moon's effects on the poles would send the needle off course. This highlights though that he's gonna act as a guide, which we will talk about later on in the video. Now the Muad'Dib also makes another appearance in the following scene, when we see a hologram of one inside a bush. Jessica then picks out a housekeeper, and I love how she goes for the badass in Mapes. Now Mapes had gone to try and see if the prophecies were true, and if the Atreides had indeed brought the Messiah. 
However, Jessica also learns something as well as she gets insight into the superstition that's been planted in the culture. Mapes is overcome with crying religiously. We got calm down and it shows how much she trusts her. We also learn the knife is. This basically translates to Sandworm 2, showing how Paul will later embrace them to help win the war. Now from here we cut to the pilgrims worshipping the trees, which are watered daily to keep them alive. Each drinks the equivalent of 5 men a day, and it showcases how much tradition can often leave others struggling. I don't know if it's a comment on royalty, or just worshipping in general, but we see they happily sacrifice their own needs to keep up the tradition. Now Paul is then attacked by a hunter seeker, and I love how we see the one who enabled it was hidden in the palace walls. This is something that always stuck with me in the books, because this guy would have basically had to cement himself in. Here he'd lie and wait until they arrived, and only get the one chance to take out his target. Paul manages to survive by remaining completely still because he knows the hunter seeker's visions based solely on movement. This is him once more showing his mind state with a gom jabbar in which he's able to think and not immediately panic. This is also needed across the surface of Arrakis as one must move without rhythm to not alert the sandworms. One may end up panicking and running but then all it's going to do is lead them to their death. Now I know I said earlier that they don't use robots, so you're probably thinking So that was a fucking lie. Oh, but the world of Dune does in fact use machines, but nothing that's able to go above its station. This keeps AI on a rung below the humans, and therefore they can never overthrow them. Now with the Baron we see he's got a spider-like creature that's also possessing creepy human hands. No idea what's going on with this, as it's something brand new made up for the movie, but in the source material, the Baron's pets were all young boys. I'm getting the word... Nuts. So maybe they didn't want to put that in the film, but either way, there's no alien races in Dune unless you count the sandworms. All the creatures we see are caused by spice, with this spider creature potentially being immune from that. There's also a fan theory by Ronald McBigdick on Reddit, yep, that, that's a name, Ronald McBigdick. Theory by them anyway, theory time. That this is the Benny Taliax. In the book, they're spice enhanced humans that have isolated themselves from the rest of the universe. They created some of the scariest creatures in the Dune universe and also had a hand in Peter de Vries. In this movie, he's played by David Das Malchin, making this his third team up with Villeneuve. I actually think he's died in all his films, with those being Prisoner, Blade Runner 2049, and later on in this. Though not spelled out in the film, it was de Vries who suggested the Baron that they kidnap Dr. Yue's wife, and he was the one who decided they should kill her. You can see a diamond symbol located on Yue's head, and this indicates that he's one of the Souk Doctors. This tattoo marks them as people who can't betray their patients or break their Hippocratic oath that they've sworn to the houses. However, Vries figured out they could hold his wife and he'd go against it, which leads to this really chilling line. They take her apart like a doll. Going to a meeting, we then get Gurney seeing this. They shall suck at the abundance of the seas and the treasure hid in the sand. This is a quote from Elder William Brucer, who was a leader of the Plymouth Colony. He thanked the Lord for some clams during a famine and it highlights how they've all been left with the scraps. Now my favourite quote from a holy figure is I don't like sand. Which is pretty much everyone's mood for this movie. And we then travel out to the spice silos, which are a far cry from how many the Harkonnens had in that opening montage. We learn that they've removed most of their equipment and have only left behind the, the really shit machines. They're obviously also planning an attack, so would want to get their best stuff out of the way and then bring it back to the planet. Now at this point, we then meet Stelgar reuniting two characters from No Country for Old Men. Breakdown of that on the channel now, and we see as he spits when he greets them. In any other culture, this would be taken as an insult, but with the Fremen, it has the utmost respect. Their entire existence is about preserving water, and thus spitting could be very costly to them. Stelgar carries the still scars on his face, which were done by the production team to show his history of violence. And at this point, we meet Leah Kynes, who we learn has been working for the Emperor. However, she's also been helping the Fremen secretly, so one day they can be free. This will allow them to terraform the planet and live on the surface with an abundance of water. Huge shoutouts again to Bucks and Nachos who went into why Herbert created this character. Apparently, he was a reporter out in Oregon who was going over a story about ecologists working with the beach. The sands had been blowing up and destroying the farmlands, making it near impossible for food to be grown. Ecologists were trying to introduce beach grass and this in the end would slow and delay the effects. Bucks and Nachos brought up how he saw civilization could be swallowed by the desert and he wanted an ecologist who could help save the day. Now she ends up giving them their still suits which recycle their sweat into drinkable water. Out in the desert we get a rescue scene with the harvester crew and this helps to give us lots of different things. 
Firstly, the machines are lifted by balloons because if they made their entire journey on land, they would just attract the worms. It also shows that Paul will try and save people, whereas the Harkonnens would have just let them die. Gives him his first encounter with Spice, and he also witnesses the giant worms up close. The first time Spice hits him, we also get a line showing that the Kwisat Tadarak has now been awakened. Now when designing the worms, Villeneuve spent a year concepting the creatures and they dove into every detail on the beast. Whether it was the texture of the skin or how it eats food, they really wanted to give an authenticity to it. VFX supervisor Paul Lambert studied the movement of whales and also their mouths which we can see in their teeth. Whales have baleen which help them to filter food which is also something they brought across to the worm. When crafting the scene they also had sand mimic the movement of water, giving a feeling of seeing a whale rising from the ocean. Going with a beast that looks prehistoric, the worms are beautiful but also completely terrifying. Now obviously this movie needs a lot of VFX but the creative team did something that rarely ever happens. Instead of using green screen they actually used sand screen so the environment around the actors appeared more natural. I watch this movie with a Philips Hue light hooked up and you can see it just beaming browns, oranges and yellows. Really makes this whole thing pop and adds a distinctive look to the whole of Arrakis. Now back in his room, Paul explains the vision of Chani stabbing him and you might start to wonder, what, what's going on? Well, this is really her giving him the Chris knife and the stabbing's because it's killing his past self. Among this, he also sees his mother pregnant and giving birth to his little sister Alia. Can't talk about it too much as she's a major thing in part 2, but I like that they're at least laying the groundwork. One thing that I found out in my research as well is that Rebecca Ferguson, she's only actually 12 years older than Chalamet. Still though, never crossed my mind and I think they made it feel like there was a much bigger age gap. Now from here we cut to Salusa Secundus, which is the home of the mighty Saduka. The Saduka, or Saduku I always end up calling them, they're known as the most fearsome army in the universe, but Paul ends up realising the Fremen are stronger. In order to survive on Arrakis, one has to be built different and this is why they're capable of beating them. We then see them getting anointed before battle in what's almost like a religious ceremony. Passed by priestesses, they place a thumb with blood on their head which is similar to what priests and vicars do for blessings. You can also catch their wrists seem like they're wearing rosary beads and we get further religious imagery with where the blood comes from. This is drained from men that have been crucified upside down and you can see as their blood runs into a trough. We can also hear that distinctive throat singing again which is based on techniques from Mongolia and Tibet. The city is then attacked with Yue lowering the shields and the duke is sadly betrayed before he's then captured. He sees a light flashing in the desert, signalling to commence, and then finds that Mapes has been stabbed. In the scene right before this, he also met with Jessica and clearly knew that something was going to happen. During this, we cut to the bull sculpture, highlighting what this fight is really for. In the battle, we can see Gurney running head into it and can also catch Duncan Idaho clashing with the soldiers. At one point, he taps the anti gravity thing on his belt, and just like the Baron, this helps him to float. He ends up stealing an ornithopter and I love how he just kind of scares some soldiers away after killing a handful. Such a badass and at this point Lady Jessica and Paul are taken to the desert which is where they're going to be left to die. You might be wondering how they get their equipment but there is a little clue given to us in the ornithopter. Jessica spots a pole that has a little diamond etched into it and this is the symbol of Dr. Yue. Underneath it is a little kid and this has the tent and the equipment within it. Inside that tent they also find a roll of paper, once more with Dr. Yue's symbol. Yue of course also helps the duke and even though he betrays him, he gives him a way to get revenge. This is sort of still keeping his oath, well not really, but at least he aided him in the end. Also I love the way how we see the voices used here and Jessica even bites down on one of the god's fingers. Again it highlights how powerful her mouth is and how it can be used as a weapon which Careful guys, careful! At this point the Baron meets with the Duke and Leto ends up staring at a bullhead. This is just like what his father saw before he faced death but he went out fighting like the Duke does here. Also I realised when I've been recording this I've been calling him Duke Leto and then I was like I think it might be Leto too so apologise for being an idiot. I have that same issue with Jared Leto where I'm like is it Leto, is it Leto? I don't know uh, but yeah the pronunciation again it's it's not going to be too accurate but it's too late to change it so just leave, leave it out in the comments please. Now from here we see is the Baron also calls him cousin. No future spoilers but yeah we'll probably learn about the messed up lineage during part 2. For what the Baron did during this the Reverend Mother ended up cursing him and thus he ended up with his giant obese body. Duke then witnesses him hovering above the table and oh, they fly now! They fly now! They fly now!
After killing Yue, the duck gets the Baron coming closer, and it's at this point he releases the gas. The reason why this is chosen as a weapon is because it's something that can infiltrate the shield. This moment, Paul and Jessica also discover his ring, which Yue left them as his final gift. It shows that he's dead, and with his father gone, Paul must now step up and take over his lead. We then cut from Paul's hand down to his father, and lastly the bull looking down on them. At this moment, Paul has a vision of the future, in which he leads an unholy war across the universe. We can see here that he's mastered the sandworms, and a similar shot's going to be used in part 2 with Chani. After witnessing a bloody hand, he then sees a journey back to Kaladin, where we can see him joined by Chani, and also Jamis to the right. This again shows the future could be changed, with it suggesting that Paul may still have control. This future will likely be explored in Dune Messiah, which shows how religion can be used as a weapon. We can also catch Paul's eyes glowing blue, with the effects of these being done with BFX. Initially, they wanted to just use contact lenses, but quickly realised how much trouble it was going to be. The desert, of course, would keep kicking sand up in your eyes, and in the end, they just went with CGI. A Darth Maze on Reddit caught some amazing symbolism in this moment, as we get a close-up of the water tubes on the tent. These look like veins and blood, making this tent almost appear womb-like. Paul then emerges, like he's reborn, and the first thing he sees is that little Muad'Dib. This symbolises the new change within him, and he's now being born under that moniker. The little mouse is also perfectly evolved to be something that survives in this harsh desert landscape. This is a symbol of endurance, which is something that Paul will also come to represent. Rescued by Duncan and Dr. Kynes, they then travel out to a Fremen outpost that was meant to change the planet to a paradise. However, this was later abandoned, but it might be something that pops up in the future. Duncan also pays close attention to the plants, which may hint at something that happens in the sequel. Also, I'm skipping over a line here in which Paul suggests making a play as, again, future spoilers. What do you mean it's a heavy spoiler show and I should tell you all? Well, you're gonna have to wait, mate. It's coming out soon. Either way, Duncan dies here and the Sadaka arrive in what's a really cool moment. Just love seeing them float down silently, but the Fremen are waiting here with an ambush. This highlights how they can stand against them and use the power of the desert, but right now, they're just not good enough. They need a leader, and everyone knows that, so both Kynes and Duncan try and buy Paul time. Kynes ends up using a thumper, and the sound of this is almost like a beating heart, with worms being like blood that moves through the veins of the planet. This is also like how the movie opens, and after the logos, we can hear it thumping away. We see Kynes then readying her hooks, but unfortunately, she never gets to ride the worm. As we see at the end though, there are worm riders out there, and this will become something bigger later on. I think they did this here to just tease what would come, but wanted to save the first major ride for that upcoming sequel. Also, I love how she gets stabbed in the back, you can actually catch water spurting out the suit instead of being blood. This also drips into her hand as she lies on the ground, which is such a cool way to change what we typically see. Being the way for the worm, we then see as they're all engulfed, showing what the true power here is. Now Paul and Jessica then escape into the storm, and after a lesson from Jamis, Paul learns to let go. This is him realising fear is the mind killer, and thus he decides not to panic. At this point we then cut to the Baron healing, and he says, Kill them all. Again, going back to the Colonel Kurt similarities, this could be a nod to his final order. Will it ended up coming across his notes, and scribble on them it said exterminate them all. We already have a big breakdown on Apocalypse now, so if you want to check that out, it's on the channel as well. Now with Paul and Jessica, we see as they crash and come face to face with a worm. Paul ended up panicking in the end and running, and it shows that he truly hasn't mastered everything. He ends up making it to the rocks, and the worm then pauses almost like a sign of respect. Kinda strikes me as being like Paul staring into the abyss, and in it, realising what he is. The mouth beats away like a heart, again tying back to this idea of a thumper. Taken in by the Fremen, he then sees a vision of Duncan sitting on the rock that the pair have just passed. Like him, he ended up integrated into the group, and this not only shows Duncan's past, but also Paul's future. To me, this showcases how Duncan's still a guiding force to him, showing him the possibility if they become allies. We also get a moment where Chani shows him another Muad'Dib, showing that if it can survive here, then Paul can survive too. Jamis here also appears like a mentor again, which further highlights how the future can be changed. Jamis then calls the Antal challenge, with a final fight being between him and Paul. Now Jamis, the reason why he's such a dick like you mate, is because he wants to see if the prophecy is true. He basically assumes that Paul and Jessica are spoiled rich chums, and sees them both as being easy wins. Little does he know though, Kid's been trained by some of the best fighters in the universe, and therefore he makes mincemeat of Jamis. See ya chump. 
Shani gives him the Chris knife, and we see that this also has a diamond on it again, playing into the idea that this gives way to something helpful. Paul ends up besting Jamis pretty easily, and we see as he puts the blade up to his neck. This is in order to get him to yield, but it's also something that Gurney Halleck taught him. Calling back to their battle at the beginning, this was also a move pulled out to try and end the fight, and it both failed, and it leads to Paul killing him to take that next path. That will lead into him getting desert power. Which brings things full circle from the beginning. Now we see Paul heading towards the worm instead of running away because this will be the weapon that helps win the war. He will become a rider, a mentad, and also someone who like the spacing guilds able to fold time and space. He also knows the ways of the Bene Gesserit and in the end will be the supreme being. Anyway, that closes out Dune Part 1 and thank you for coming on this journey. As for the film's performance, I'm sure you already know, but this was dropped as a day one on HBO Max. It's a bold strategy cotton, let's see if it pays off for them, and it caused lots of issues with Legendary and Villeneuve who was pretty annoyed by it. He said that a film like this should be experienced in the cinema, with streaming just being something that pales in comparison. Bloody hell no mate, I've got a, got a 60 inch 4K OLED and an Atmos setup, what are, you, what are you talking about? Fuck off. Anyway, he also criticised the piracy potential, and I think in hindsight it was a bad move. That was what made Nolan walk away from Warner Brothers, and the worst thing is, they didn't even Warner Brother. He shopped his next film, Oppenheimer, out to Universal, and in the end, we know how that did. At the box office though, June made 400 million, and this was coming off the back of 165, made 41 million opening weekend, and beat Godzilla vs Kong which had 31. On streaming it was watched by 400 million in the first 30 days, and it led to it being a pretty big success. That's why Warner Brothers was so confident with part 2, and there's also rumblings of an upcoming TV show. Either way, we're going to see what happens next, and I hope you've enjoyed our trip out to Arrakis. We do breakdowns like this every week, and if you've enjoyed it, please hit subscribe. If you're feeling extra generous, then please click the join button where you'll get early access to all of our big breakdowns. That costs just 99 pence or 99 cents a month, and it's a sort of give what you can thing where we're trying that out for new people who want to help the channel. I really don't want to ask people to break the bank, and yeah, just that little amount a month goes a long way for videos like this. And next we're going to be tackling the Wicker Man, and we'll of course also be diving into Dune Part 2. I think I'm going to do an ending explain, and then when it finally drops digitally, do a big in-depth breakdown. Just easier when I have it at home at hand to watch, and also I'd love to hear your thoughts, and if there's anything we missed, then please drop it below. Make sure you also check out our arrival breakdowns in No Country for Old Men, which will be linked on screen right now. Without the way, thank you for clicking this. I've been Paul, you've been the best, I'll see you next time. Take care, peace.